All right, I see Blackie is calling. Let's get a break. We'll come right back after it with the one and only Blackie Lawless exclusive interview coming up live on Trunk Nation right after this. All righty. Welcome back, everybody, to Trunk Nation here on Sirius XM Volume 106. Talking rock with you every day. It is Eddie Trunk. And this is a guy that, as I said earlier, so many people have asked me about. You got to get him on the show. He's got what's going on with him. We're going to get answers to all those questions. He's also an old friend who I have a tremendously long history with. And it's always great to talk with him. It's been far too long. We welcome now to the show Blackie Lawless. How are you, bud? Blackie. Yes. There I'm you doing are. Good. Good to good to hear from you, man. You've been holding up through all these cra- this crazy couple of years we're we're dealing with. Well, you know, like everybody else, uh, you just keep putting one foot forward in front of the other and hope for the best. Yeah, that's all you can do, and 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 it's nothing but conflicting information as to tours that are starting, tours that aren't starting. Have you um, during this time of COVID and so many artists locked down? Tell me about what you've been doing creatively. I know we're going to talk about a tour here in a second, but what have you been doing? Because as a songwriter, I imagine that you got some good material. This is a cause for some good material around now. It is, uh, but at the same time, I was one of the first people that contracted this stuff. And it was kind of a bizarre thing because um, James Hetfield was having a showing at the Peterson Museum here in L.A. for his cars. And I hadn't been anywhere in quite some time. So I thought, okay, you know, I mean, I'm a car guy. So went down to see the cars. What we weren't anticipating when we got there is that we found out later it was the single largest event in the history of the Peterson Museum. There was like a 1,000 people there and a lot of fans. So as soon as we walked in the door it turns into a little bit of an in-store appearance. And mm-hmm. so people wanting photos and, and you know, want, you know, just to say hello and things like that. Well, when you're taking photos and all that, you know, everybody gets up close and everybody's breathing on everybody else. Yep. So I would go to the show, everything's fine. About a week later, I start feeling kind of tough. And I thought, you know, a couple of days into it, and I thought, well, I've got the flu. Well, about four days in, which normally you would start feeling better, I wasn't. So I thought, well, tomorrow I'll feel better. And the next day I get up, I was worse. And I thought, well, this is a bad one. I'll be better tomorrow. Because the next day I was even worse than that. So this goes on for about seven, eight days. And I'm getting at the end of my rope, and I'm thinking, what the hell is this? And uh, then I lose my taste and smell and all that. That went on for like two more weeks after that. But we don't know what this is because there's no name for it yet. I mean, this is still, it was the end of January in uh, 2020. So then I start getting better, but it goes on for, for weeks and weeks. And so we didn't know what it was. Then we start hearing this rumbling that there's something out there with this, you know, this funny name on it. So, you know, about three months, it took really a better part of three months to really shake it. You know, so after that time, then I decided, you know, to start working a little bit and, um, you know, got us to the point basically where we are now. And I've got quite a bit of material that we've been working on, quite diligently, actually. Well, before we get to new, I mean, there's a lot to talk about because you really haven't done any interviews and you really have been very much for the most part off the radar here in the U.S., which is why, you know, I've reached out to you a few times in recent years and said, hey, do you want to come on? Because the fans are always asking about you, asking what you're up to. And I've told them all repeatedly, hey, Wasp works in Europe and you do a lot of stuff outside of America, but you really haven't done a lot in the U.S., that's all about to change, which is what we're going to talk about uh, for, uh, today, among other things. But fill everybody in, Blackie, on what you've been doing and the news that you're about to announce about a tour that you're about to embark on here in the U.S. Well, this goes back a, really a few years. We did the last European tour in 2017. When we did that... The word got out in America that it was happening, and the fan base really decided that they wanted to see this band back in the United States. Now, 
we're we're kind of a strange band in the sense that our following is ravenous, and I cannot overestimate that. The following that we have, I mean, at no point in our history have Wasp ever been the biggest band in the world. But the following that we do have, it's it's almost cult-like. So what these guys did, out of the goodness of their heart, a couple of thousand of them in the United States decided to get together all at one time. They all started talking to each other. They started reaching out to promoters. I've never seen anything like this happen before. And what they did is they created an awareness in the promoters' minds that really facilitated or got this ball rolling. And so, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to everybody that did that. Because, you know, for the longest time, we had it's been 10 years since we played in the United States. And everybody says, well, why don't you play here? Do you not want to play here? What's going on? I don't know of a band around, I've never met a band, that if you gave them a good tour to do, would refuse it. And we're no different. But it's a question of putting the right things together. But it's also those promoters believing that there's an audience out there to be had. So, like I said, we go back to the fan base on this. The interest and the fervor they created lit this fuse back in 2017. And it's been going on ever since. So we we signed with TKO, the booking agency, one of the, the bigger booking agencies in the United States, they reach out to some top flight promoters around the country, and because of that, I'm proud to say we begin for the first time in 10 years, October of this year, the 40th anniversary tour of Wasp. Back and that's in US. And that well, we now I have those dates, and this is all going to hit with a press release in about twenty minutes here. But I, but we're breaking it here on this show, and I appreciate you coming on and doing that. A couple questions on that, Blackie. You you talked about the passion of your fan base who drove this thing back in twenty seventeen. We all know there's a lot of bands that have passionate fans that really want to see them live. Where do you, but 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 you're saying you're you're your fans really went the extra mile here. Where do you think, what do you think that you've done or Wasp has done in your career, musically connecting with the fans, whatever the case may be, that has generated fans that passionate? Where do you think it comes from? What do you think the connection is that's so strong to you and the band? First and foremost, I think it's honesty. And I think that would be the case with any, any artist. What are you saying and, and in this particular case with me, this goes back to prior to us recording The Headless Children. Because I went through a period after we finished the record prior to that, which was inside the Electric Circus, we had been on the road for about three or four years at that point. We'd done a record and a tour and a record and a tour and a record and a tour. You get out of that cycle, and you're literally punch drunk. You feel like you've been 15 rounds at a champ and lost every round. You know, I mean, you don't know who you are. Right around that point, I we came off the road. I went into a bank to cash a check. This is a true story. I went in there. I was standing in front of the teller. I wrote out the check for the amount that I wanted, signed it, did everything. I got to the date. I started writing the date out, and it was like March 20th. I got to the year, and I stopped. And the teller's looking at me, and about 15, 20 seconds goes by, and he told me what year it was. He realized I didn't know the year. <laughs> and when he told me that, I thanked him for it. I, since I've told that story, I've had other musicians tell me similar things that have happened to them like that. So it, you literally get punchy over a period of time. But I went through a period after that where I said, you know what? Who am I? What am I doing? When we were doing our first album, I came in the studio one day, and the engineer who was in there, he was one of these guys, very upbeat, high energy, and he was a lot of fun to be around. And he says, and I said to him, 
you know, I walked in, I says, something bothering me, and he was real quiet. And so after about an hour, him not really engaging, I said, what's going on? He says, I just got news that Marvin Gaye was murdered last night. And so he started telling me that he had done a couple of records with Marvin. And so I just let him talk for a while. I mean, we, we, just, we didn't work. We didn't do anything. And he told me, he says, you know, he says, I learned one thing from Marvin. He says that any artist, whatever they're doing, that record they're doing at that moment should reflect who they are and what they're thinking. Not what's going on in the charts, not what's hot out there or whatever's in vogue, any of that. Who are you? What do you have to say that's authentic? Because you can't try to mask it. I mean, if you're making pop music, that's one thing, and, and there is a place for that. But if you're trying to communicate to an audience... And you're the kind of person that you're going to develop a lifelong kinship with an audience. And you're going to take them on that lifelong ride. They have to feel like they know you intimately. You have to allow those people the freedom, literally, to take off their shoes and start walking around inside your head to find the good, the bad, some of this stuff maybe you don't want to know, but all that stuff is reflected in the lyrics. And when you display that type of honesty, that endures people or endears people to you. Bucky, let me, Bucky, let me, let me just key to any artist. Let me let me With jump that, in on that. As a songwriter, is that a difficult thing for you to do? For you to be that open, would you prefer to write in character, or or, or is is that? I imagine to open yourself up to be that honest in your lyrics with what you're going on, what's going on at that time, is not easy to do. Is that would I be spot on on that, or or is it? At is times, it more therapeutic? At times you are correct because you know it's a, writing is always a discovery process. When I wrote the Crimson Idol, everybody asked me when that record was finished, "Well, who is that character?" You know, is it you? And I said, no. I said, this is a guy. He's a half a dozen different guys I know in the music industry. He's a little of this guy, a little of that guy, a little something else. You know, maybe 10% of me. And I rolled them all together, and that's who you get. Well, years go by, and I realized there was far more of me in him than I ever gave it credit for. Now, I'm not saying 100%, but way more than I thought there was. So that's a process of self-discovery. But as a person, as a writer, you've got to be, you know, like Peter Gabriel said, digging in the dirt to find the places where we got hurt. You've got to be willing to go into those places. I went into that spot when I was making that record, and I stayed there for about two years. And when I came out of it, it was cathartic, and not necessarily in a good way. You know, I mean, there was there was things I discovered about myself, my childhood, things like that. And it's like I'm finished with a project, and I'm thinking, why the hell do I feel the way I feel right now? I, I don't feel so great. You know, how did this happen? Because you're uncovering a lot of stuff. But I think, well, I don't think I know. You have to be willing to share that with people. And I, there's some artists out there that don't want to do that. And, hey, you know what? If they're successful and they don't have to, more power to them. But for myself, I found that is the key to really locking in that relationship with a fan base across the board. And I really don't people, know any other way to do it. Yeah, and if people really know the Wasp catalog and know your work as a writer... They know that that's been a theme throughout because it, when you're talking, Blackie, about heavy moments and things and writing about them, and I mentioned to my audience before, you and I go way, way back. I mean, I think you were my first interview when the first record came out, and we, we talked about that very funny story back in 83. <laughs> but since then, you know, we've, we've always been in touch. And I'll never forget when you came into my studio, and this is now 20 years ago, in New York City right after 9-11. And, of course, you're originally from New York. And I remember the impact that had on you coming into my studio. You met some of my friends who were police officers. And the, I remember you were, you were you know, really um, impacted by that. And I do recall 
that the next record came out, Dying for the World, and and there was stuff on that record that was very connected to that, including a brilliant song called Hallowed Ground about that, I imagine, that experience. So I actually witnessed that firsthand, how that manifested itself in the music you were making. I don't see how anybody could witness what we all saw at that time and not feel moved by it. And you recall I had my dad with me at the time, and I remember the day prior to coming in to do your show, um, the World Series was going on, and that's the, yeah. the reason we were there. And But before the game, we went down to uh, ground zero. And the thing that hit me the most that day was that smell, that electrical smell of burning wires. It was everywhere. You couldn't escape it. And so we were down there for an hour and a half, maybe, and we left and got something to eat before we went to the stadium. And I remember my nose draining while I was eating, and I could taste that those burning wires in the back of my throat. That freaked me out. I'd never experienced anything like that before. And so how can someone experience something like that and not be moved? Then the next day we come in your studio, and you were talking about the police that were in there, and they've got that thousand-yard stare. And, again, you're just you're constantly being assaulted everywhere you turn with the faces that you're looking at. Not to mention that this is a this is not just me witnessing this at the moment. This goes back into my childhood. I mean, I, I grew up over in Staten Island. I had family members that walked the steel on those buildings when those things were going up. You know, so anybody that that has a history there, they're going to take that very very personal. Yeah. I want to talk to you specifically about this tour because this is the the big news and this is the exciting news for for all the fans that have been asking me and like you said asking you about US activity for Wasp. But uh and we're we have plenty of time here so we'll get into specific dates and specifics about the tour here in a second. But I got about 2-3 minutes before I have to hit a break. I'm curious Blackie you you had said that this fan swell started in 17 is the reason why we're getting these shows in the u.s in 2022 really just because that's how long it took to put together and i imagine because we've lost a couple of years of touring because of covid was that would this have happened sooner if it wasn't for the pandemic i couldn't really answer that because we weren't scheduled to do anything prior to this but to get this to the point of where it is now didn't start yesterday I mean, to start building this, this has been about a year in the making to get to the point where we are now. So just to start that process, there's a decent amount of time before that where I have to find the right agent. You know, I have to find the right press team to put together. I mean, things aren't exactly the way they used to be when major labels were around. You know, any band today is going to have those people working with them, you create a network of doing that kind of stuff. So it's a little different than it used to be, and you have to learn to adapt and, you know, how you're going to put your team together, and do you have the people you trust? Are they good? You know, that, that sort of thing. But it was, like I said, this wasn't created overnight. So this took a while to get this to the point where the promoters were seeing from the fan base the interest that was being generated. That seed was planted, but I also think that that seed needed time to really to grow in their heads and the promoters' heads to understand that yes, there is something to be had there. And uh, you know, I'm happy to say a number of guys across the U.S. have stepped up to make this happen as far as the promoters. Yeah, and you've always said to me that you're not going to go out and play Wasp shows unless it's the right venue, unless you can bring your gear in, unless you can present it in the right way. You're not going to be somebody that's going to do a throw and go in a in a little club, and you know you want it to be at the level that people would expect from Wasp. So uh, that's, well, that's part of thing, it too, you know, because YouTube has changed everything. You know, so what people film today 
you know, at a show, that's up online at night. So somebody in Czechoslovakia or the Czech Republic is seeing a show that was recorded in, you know, in Kansas City yesterday. And it's that networking exists all over the world now, so there's no way. It's pretty hard to hide things now when it comes to that. In the old days, you know, artists or labels could move publicity in the direction they wanted. But you can't do that now. So if we're going to do something in one part of the world, I have every reason to believe that someone that's in Nashville, Tennessee, or Orlando, Florida, or wherever they may be, they're going to go online, they're going to look at those shows that were being done in bigger venues, and if you're not doing that, when you get to their town, they're more than likely going to be disappointed. I would be. Yeah. Hey, man, I hate to cut in on you, but I got to do a quick break here. I'm going to put you on hold. We'll come right back, okay? All right. We'll put Blackie on hold. We'll come right back after the top of the hour with a lot more with Blackie Lawless, including your calls right after this on Trunk Nation. Okay, we're back. Another hour to go here on a Wednesday edition of Trunk Nation, Talk and Rock with you here on Volume. Blackie Lawless is my guest who has been generous with his time. He's going to stay with us for this final hour. Uh, there's a lot to cover because Blackie hasn't done any interviews really in a long time and certainly has not toured in a really long time in America, 10 years to be exact, and that is what he is here to announce. And that tour, uh, Blackie, let's get into it because that's what fans are excited about. 40th anniversary tour of the band kicking off October 29th, Anaheim, California, uh, with dates rolling through December 9th currently, uh, wrapping up in San Francisco. So you start in California, end in California. Tell me about this tour, what you have planned from a, a set list a set list uh, situation because obviously there is a big catalog of, of Wasp songs. You want to celebrate the catalog, but also from a production standpoint, because many people know Wasp is synonymous with big shows and many of the things that you've done over the decades. So what can fans expect to see and hear on this tour? Well, the first thing you, you would want to, to discuss when we are in production meetings is what are we going to play? And I think it's understandable that you would want to do what is going to be considered the things that are mandatory. I mean, if we don't play I Want to Be Somebody, there's going to be a riot. You know, and it's understandable. I get that. But, you know, you're, we're doing the better part of two hours. That gives me a chance to do some stuff I've never done. And what I mean by that is, there are songs in the catalog that we have never played live before. And I want to get into some of those. And But equally as important with that, when we had our first production meeting a couple of months ago about it, we realized that there wasn't going to be enough time to do everything we wanted to do. Now, normally we don't do this because whatever show you put together because your production value, rehearsals, things like that, you don't really want to start getting off the script too far. But we're making a conscious, eff- a conscious effort at this point to vary that show a little bit from night to night. So if, so- if we're doing multiple nights in a given city, let's say you're going to do two or three nights in the same place, that show's going to be a little bit different every night. We're doing that b- for the fans, but we're also doing it to pay respect to that catalog. And uh, it might be a little on the self-indulgent side, but we're going to play stuff that we think people would want to hear and be pleasantly surprised. You're always going to have people that are going to want to hear obscure B-sides and things like that, and I get that. But for the most part, when we've tried things like that in the past before, there's a hand <clears throat> excuse me a handful of people in the front that are going yeah 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 that's great that's great and but you see you know a confused look on the face of 95% right. of the audience you know so you have to really be careful 
not to overindulge with stuff like that, but <clears throat> we're going to be careful to make sure that whatever we do when we go off the script is going to be something people are going to want to hear. And I'll be further honest with you at this point. We're going to need <clears throat> to get into rehearsal to find out what's going to work and what isn't. Because if it's material, some of the that we've never played before, I think every band's had the experience of being in a studio and something really sounding great when they're there. But when they try to recreate it live, it falls on its face for whatever reason. And, you, and at the same time, you also have some stuff you think are sleepers that this may not translate. Um, and you're, you're pleasantly surprised there when it does. But it's a little strange. And you also have to remember that any band that is a the band that's been around for a long time, after your first two or three records and you've been established, every time you do an album after that, that album ends up becoming the opening act. Because when that new record comes out, people already have in their heads what they're coming to that show to hear. So when that new record comes out, that new record gets treated like an opening act. Nobody knows them. Mm -hmm. And so for that new, new record to stand up to the old material, it's got to be quality stuff. So it'll be a little bit like that with this as well. So we won't know until we get in there, but I do feel very certain that there's going to be maybe 25% of this show things we've never played before. So I'm looking forward to that aspect of it. Visually, when we did Inside the Electric Circus, I my original idea for that tour was to make it look like an old circus sideshow, you know, almost like a freak show. Well, because we were doing arenas, the general consensus from everybody involved was that it wasn't big enough. It wasn't flashy enough. So it started being built bigger and bigger and bigger, and it morphed into something that was very, very bright, filling up a big space. And I regretted that over the years because it, it, it got so far away from my original vision, it turned into a, a rock band playing in Las Vegas. You know, and it was big and it was bombastic, but it wasn't what my original idea was. We're going back to that idea now because we felt that that idea encapsulated a lot of the things that we were doing in the beginning. So when people see this thing, they're going to walk into the room. The, the production is going to be kind of semicircle on the stage. You're going to see all kinds of, like the old sideshow banners. They used to sh show the sword swallower, you know, and the snake lady and things like that. The drums are going to be built onto bales of hay. Hmm. You know, so you're going to see all those elements, but you're going to smell that stuff too, we hope, when you walk <laughs> in. What we're trying to do is when you walk in the door, it's almost like you're walking through the, the, the flap of a circus tent. We want you not just to be in the audience. We want you to feel like you're actually in this thing as if you were part of an old circus inside of an old circus tent. You know, I, I did a uh, big special recently with Nikki Six for his book, The First 21, and I'm sure you've heard about this by now, but he talks about his time meeting you very early on, playing with you very early on, and what an influence and impact that you had on him. And there's been other books that have come out recently, too, about the early Wasp shows and what you were doing around Southern California with the raw meat and the rack and all of those things that was just beyond shocking uh, at that time, just, you know, blew people away. When you look back on that stuff in retrospect, how do you feel about it? And is that an element that you would reintroduce, given that this is a 40th anniversary tour? There is elements of it that we will do, but it won't be the same way it was before. And I'm just going to leave it at that because I don't want to let too much out. We were faced with, and I'm going to be very honest, we were faced with the idea of has the world's sensibilities changed 
from the time that we originally started doing this to now. The general consensus was, yes, it has changed. So we don't want to get into a situation where musically we're doing one thing and the visuals conflict with it. Because what we started doing in the beginning, we believed was social comment. And it astounded us that more people didn't get that idea. You know, the only thing they saw was the bombast of the presentation we were doing. And I remember we would sit and we would scratch our heads and we would say, don't these people understand what we're trying to say here? And they weren't getting it. And so after a few records of that, I thought, you know what? The only way to get people to listen to what you're doing is you've got to turn the visual down. Because anytime people go to a show, and it's natural, we all do it, people end up listening with their eyes more than their ears. And so, and i go back to the Crimson Idol for just a moment. I learned in the making of that record one of the things that made Bob Dylan what he was or is, and that Bob was Bob and an acoustic guitar. Whenever he had something really important to say, you could hear it because he doesn't have, you know, some insane rock and roll band blasting behind him at 9 million watts. So I took that cue when I did the Crimson Idol when I thought I've got something really important to say. I turned that music down. And it was either some, you know, some keyboard thing that I was singing with or an acoustic guitar or something like that because, like I said, People, most of the time, are going to listen with their eyes and not their ears. So if you're really trying to hammer a point home, you have to do just that. you got to really drop breadcrumbs along the way and say, this is where we're going with this. There's a song in the Wasp catalog that you have not played for decades that when I told people you were coming on was the first thing they asked me to see if it would come back into the set. And that song, I'm sure you know where I'm going, is Animal. Oh, yeah. Where are you, what yeah. are your thoughts on that, and will that make a reappearance? I don't know. There's a part of me that says it's already out there. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Do I owe it to the fan base to really make this a true retrospect of what we're done of of what we've done if i had to give you an answer right now i would say i'm leaning in the direction of doing it well that'll make your fans happy because that was the one that when i told people that, that you got to ask him if he's going to finally do it is he going to finally do it why did you drop it initially blackie was it just it didn't feel comfortable for you anymore two reasons number one my my religious convictions but uh you know my christian faith i thought well you know this is not really something that i want to say but also there was another reason as well that if you're we were doing more serious material do you really want that conflict of messaging going on at the same time so there was a twofold reason for it and i think it's you know really we haven't played that song in quite some time. It's probably going on 15 years now. Um, but however long it's been, I think I think I made my point. And so we're in the process of, we're discussing it. Let's put it that way. Tell me about the band that you have going out with you. There's been a number of different lineups of Wasp over the decades. Who do you have joining you on the tour? Who's the band going to be? Well, Mike Duda is the longest tenure. Mike's been in the band 25 years now, the bass player. And uh, Mike's tenure in the band is second only to myself. And Doug Blair is a guitar player. Doug's been with us 18 years. You know, so the stability of this lineup has been pretty solid for a pretty long time. You know, uh, the, the drummer that we're using has been with us now for six years, Achilles Priester. And um, that lineup, like I said, it's 
if you look at the history of the band, without question, has been the most stable lineup we've ever had. Do you have contact with other members of Wasp in the past? And I couldn't not ask you about Chris Holmes. I'm sure you know there was a documentary. He, you know, he's had some allegations there against you about not being paid on things. Do you have any response to that? I don't really know much about I spoke to Randy Piper a couple of years ago. Um, I don't really know what's going on with the rest of the guys. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what you're talking about with Chris about not being paid. Chris, at two different points in his musical career, received settlements from this band. He signed documents as such, and he was paid quite well. So I really I haven't seen what you're talking about. I'm the answer I'm giving you right now is based on what you just said to me. Well, there's a That's documentary, really which I'm i am sure you haven't seen the documentary, but there's a documentary called Mean Man that's not just about about his time with you, but that's a big part of it, obviously. But but I'm assuming you haven't seen the documentary then? No. Okay. Well, in that, I mean, he talks about a lot. It's not just all you, but there's, you know, he, he, he alleges that whether it's through you or others that, you know, there's money and songwriting credits and what have you that he didn't didn't get that he's due. That is not true. Let me ask you about the lineup of uh, oh, the opening act. You're going to bring Armored Saint out with you as the opening act for the entire tour. And then as uh, I'm extremely excited about this, in Texas and Oklahoma, your show in Tulsa, which is on November 6th, and then the Texas shows run November 2 through uh, 5. The dates just came out. Uh, you've got Michael Shanker as a big UFO fan. That's exciting for me. What a double, what a double treat that is. Wasp, Michael Shanker, Armored Saint in Texas and Oklahoma. The rest of the bill, uh, the rest of the lineup is with Armored Saint. So talk about those decisions, if you will. Well, we have a long history with Armored Saint. I mean, we both. This too is their 40th anniversary. This tour. So we all go back to that magical period. That was L.A. 82, 83. And we, were, we all rode that wave, and they were very much a part of that. And um, to have them back out with us again is great because, like I said, we rode that wave in 82 and 83. Everybody who got their deals got their deals, and a lot of times you really don't see anybody again after that at all, if, if ever. And if you do, sometimes it's only sporadically. But we were fortunate enough on our first U.S. tour in 85, uh, we did a package with Armored Saint, uh, Wasp, and Metallica. You know, and so we did two months of doing that. So, you know, our, have, our paths have crossed over the years. And uh, I love those guys. Yeah, great band. And, you know, John. John's another guy, John Bush, another guy that for a long time did not want to tour. And now is his kids are older, and now he seems to have talked to him, definitely has the itch to get out there a little bit. So to, by my estimation, this will be the most large-scale touring they've done in terms of the U.S. in a very long time. So that's that's another... Yeah, I, got a great, I got a great respect for him. He's a talented guy. Yeah. I mean, the band is great. But John is, he is a really, really talented guy. And I've, you know, I've not seen everything he's done since we started back in the early 80s. But, you know, I would see things he would do from time to time. And uh, he's, he's a serious guy. You know, and oh, I'm, yeah. I'm really glad to have them out. And where, how come Shanker on the handful of shows, Texas and Oklahoma, uh, is, where did that, how did that happen? Because the timing, he's starting on the, I believe, the East Coast, whatever it was, because I asked about doing more dates together. It seems that the two bands are going in different directions on the tour. And the Texas thing, just the timing happened where everybody could be in that same location roughly at the same time. So after the, the Tulsa show, they're going one direction and we're going the other. And like I said, I wish it could have been more of it because... 
listen, he he's something else. <laughs> when I say that, you know, I'm, for a lot of reasons, but he may not even be aware of it. But his history in us, with us, goes back a lot more than he may even remember. I mean, the first time we met him was in 78, when Chris and I had the band Sister. Mm -hmm. And there was a period in L.A. where UFO had played a show, and he went missing after that, and nobody knew where he was. <laughs> and there was, there was a rumor that this, there was a religious cult called the Moonies, that the, the Moonies had kidnapped him and was converting him into their cult it wasn't true he was with us <laughs> not, i heard that rumor day. i heard that what? rumor i didn't know he was with you but i had heard that rumor about the moonies <laughs> well i'll tell you how somehow some way he me he gets to be friends with holmes i still don't know how it happened but we're in rehearsal one day we were we had this rehearsal place in hollywood and this is a true story what i'm getting ready to say right now so he, we're in rehearsing. Michael had rented some Corvette. Now, Chris, at the time, had a Honda 750 motorcycle, and this thing was a beast. I mean, this, this thing could get up close to 200 miles an hour. It, it was a no-nonsense bike that Chris had hot-rodded. <laughs> I mean, this thing was a monster. So Michael comes in. Whose bike is it? Chris is mine. He goes, can I drive it? Chris goes, no. He goes, that thing's going to get you killed. He goes, you're nowhere near prepared to get on something like that. Michael's not taking no for an answer. So this goes on for about 20 minutes, and finally Chris goes, okay, you got that vet out there? Give me the keys. Michael hands him the keys. Chris hands him the keys to the bike. So we're taking a break. And where we rehearsed, we had a little kitchenette area that was behind the rehearsal room. Now, where this kitchenette area was, there was a sidewalk about three, maybe four feet wide. And that sidewalk went from where we were all the way down to Sunset Boulevard, which was about two blocks away. And I'm in the kitchen doing something, and I, the doors were open. And I hear from a distance, mm -hmm. I look out the win I look out the window and it's him on this bike. He's come from my left hand side, flies by the window. I stick my head out of the window to watch what he's doing because at the speed he's going, Sunset Boulevard, which is a six lane road, is coming up real fast. And I'm thinking, he's gonna stop any second. He's gonna stop any second. Oh shit, he's not gonna stop. He went without, I never saw the brake lights flash. <laughs> he went across sunset and never hit the brake, nor did he get hit. And it, which is a miracle, this is like four o'clock in the afternoon. It's a miracle <laughs> he wasn't splattered all over that road. I'm now, sure. I don't know if he remembers any of this. Oh, I, Blackie, I, I not only did. well. Not only am I sure that he probably remembers it, knowing Michael, but I guarantee you Phil Mogg could tell you 55 similar stories of the time he was in the band with them because Phil has told me so many similar stories, it's not even funny. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very much in the wheelhouse of Michael Schenker's stories well, for sure. Well, a couple of days later, we decided to go out to, to a club on the Strip. He, at the end of the evening, decides he wants to drive the car. After he's had a few drinks, well, yeah. needless to say, we're poo poo on that idea. He, he, we learned about him. He's persistent when he wants to do something. We're going down Sunset. Me and Holmes. This was a four door car. It was like you know some old GTO or something like that. Michael's driving. Our bass player's in the riding shotgun. Chris and I are in the back. It got so bad we were going down a hill at one point. Chris and I were hiding in the back seat on the floorboard. <laughs> Because we knew we were going to crash. We were going to get wrapped around a telephone pole any second. You're braced so, for impact. <laughs> absolutely. And we hey, were I drunk. Gotta, 
<laughs> I got to do a quick break here. So we're going to put you on hold and then we're gonna come back. I want to ask you about potentially new music, box set, book. And then I got some callers that would love to ask you a question or two. So uh, cool. thank you for being cool. so generous. We're so, I'm so glad Wasp is back. I'm glad you're back. This is going to be awesome. Again, in case you're just tuning in, Blackie Lawless is with me and has just announced the first Wasp tour in 10 years in the U.S. WaspNation.com. Of course, this being a national broadcast, go to your go to the website, see if there's there's a date near you. Uh, the tour features Armored Saint on all the dates. If you're in Texas or Oklahoma, you're also getting Michael Schenker. Starts October 29th in Anaheim, wraps up December 9th in San Francisco, and there's obviously a bunch of, of dates you can find on the site between then. Let's, uh, let's get a quick break in here right now. We'll come right back with more with Blackie Lawless right after this on Trunk Nation on Volume. So much to talk about with Blackie Lawless. Time is just flying by. Maybe we can do another round when we get closer to the tour starting, maybe even something in person in uh, in L.A. if schedule and time permits. But uh, with the time that we have, a couple more things from Blackie, and then time permitting, I promise some of the callers uh, they could say hello and, and jump on with you. But Blackie, let me ask you about new music. Where are you at with that? Uh, have you written some stuff? Is a record imminent? The record's in the process as we speak. I mean, we've been... I've been slaving over a hot studio for for ages now, and I don't know when it's going to come out, to be honest with you, because there's going to be not scheduling conflicts, but we're going to have to space it because we have this 40th anniversary box set that's going to be coming out as well. And that thing is going to be really cool because, you know, it's going to have a big coffee table book, and there's going to be in that... I, I, we're thinking that... Um, to put it, the entire retrospective together, so you'll have, we're going to call it 40 for 40. So 40 songs for 40 years. But in addition to that, there was a set of demos that we did before we did the first album. We demoed that record three times before it was ever recorded. And by the time the first album was recorded, and people say, well, why did you re-record it for the actual record? Well, that's technical legal mumbo jumbo that labels want to own the masters when a band first starts knowing what i know now i wouldn't have done it i would have let them use the demos the demos no matter what people think of that first record i mean it's considered a classic now and i i, I get that and i appreciate it those demos are better than the first record wow this is not some sales hype i'm giving you they i've heard them there's a viciousness to those because what happened and I think any any band will tell you this that you know when you keep re-recording something and you do it over and over and over and over, you start to lose a little of that spontaneity, a little of that magic. And by the time we got to actually recording the record, that would have been the fourth time we recorded that. Hmm. And so we peaked somewhere between you know demo two and demo three. And so we're going to put all four of those in there. And uh, this is going to make a really cool set I'm excited about. And, you know, on that note for the book that I was talking about, we're going to do a thing on the website, and anybody listening now, if they want to participate in this, they can. What we're looking for people to do is if you have an old poster with a band on it or any old memorabilia or anything like that, we want you to go to the website at waspnation.com. Show us a picture of what this is, of what you have. And if it's something that we think we could use, we will then ask you to send it to us. We'll obviously we'll return it. But if you do that, you will get a credit in the back of this book. Nice. All right, so that waspnation.com is for all the Wasp fans out there. If you have some cool collectible or something that you want the guys to see, you should absolutely go ahead and, and maybe get a part, get a chance to be uh, in the book. Do you think there's a chance you would have a new song out, or do you want to before the, the tour starts? The tour still a bit down the line. I know that it's more about the history celebrating 40th, 40 years, but would you would you like to try to target at least a song by the time the tour starts, or is that not important this time around? 
Oh, then no, there'll be more than just one song. I mean, oh, okay. for that box set, you know, we're going to put two, three, maybe even four new songs on it. Okay, so uh, look you know, forward I to... Mean, you want to do that, you know, yes, you want the retrospective and all that, but you also, you know, you want to make it as well balanced as you can. You know, so like I said, we've been uh, we've been putting some time in on this. I mean, I'll be honest with you. To to do your show today, and I and I'm thrilled to do it. I really am. It's been a while since we talked, but my schedule right now is off the chart. Somebody asked me. They say, "Well, when uh, when do you get up?" I go, "Well, you know, I'm, my hours kind of vary. I usually get up around five, sometimes six. And they go, "Oh, you're an early riser, huh?" And I go, well, not exactly, because um, I go to bed sometimes at 8, 9 o'clock. And they think, <laughs> oh, well, this guy, you know, he likes to get his sleep. They don't realize I'm talking a 12-hour time shift. You know, I mean, we'll go to bed at 8 in the morning, 9 in the morning, and I'm getting up at 5 and 6 in the evening. And the reason being, you know, we built the studio, we never put clocks in it. Right. And I wanted it like that. I wanted it like a casino. I didn't want anybody worrying about what time it was. You know, it's like you go in there, you work till you're tired, and some days that maybe it's only four hours. You know, and then you're not getting anything. Is ah, we'll, we'll come back tomorrow. Some days you're in there for a long time, and those are the days you don't want to lose. You know, so like I said, your your schedule is totally bass backwards, and I I just don't care. I, it's like whatever was working for me at the time is what I'm doing. You know, so as far as having a schedule, I have no idea what that is. <laughs> well, I'm quite nocturnal myself, so I can I can relate, but uh I I I I get, you know, when you're in this business, I mean, yeah, the hours are all over the map, so you just adapt and you make you make it work for you. So thank you for getting up early, Blackie. I know you're in California, <laughs> which makes it even earlier. So I trust me, I yeah, get a it. Little bit. I I relate completely. I have a place in Vegas now. When I, I this show starts at two Eastern, when I'm in my place in Vegas, I got to set the clock to be on the air at eleven o'clock. So I get it completely. <laughs> Would, would you oh, yeah. want to? Uh, do you have an autobiography in you? Would you like to do that? You know what we're doing is everybody's asked for years. You know, when are you going to do this? When are you going to do this? And I know everybody probably says the same thing when they they've got a book they're either working on or getting ready to write. But when I sat down and really in earnest started putting stuff together. It really hit me that because, you know, when it's your life and you get used to things that are going on around you, you think, well, it's just everyday life and this is what happens and everybody's experiencing this. Well, that may be true and it may not be true because it depends on what you're used to. And when I started writing down the stuff that actually happened, I looked at it and it really blew me away. And I thought, okay, what are we going to call this thing? And I came up with the idea of Tales from the Square Mile. And what that means is, and as, as the book is getting ready to release, I'll come back and, and do your show again and we'll talk about it. But just briefly, what that's about, when I first came to Hollywood, I lived in this area that really is the Square Mile. It's the place, it, the studio that I was talking about where Michael's driving the bike down the sidewalk, I was living in the closet. That was my room. I had a, it was a walk-in closet that was three feet wide by 12 feet long. That was my bedroom. I was in there for an hour, for a year and a half. So, but in this square mile, it's very strange. It's not unlike New York City in some ways where you're with the haves and the have-nots side by side. But it's even more extreme in Hollywood because you can be in a situation where somebody is absolutely destitute broke and a block down the street is a major motion picture studio. And right. so you have a tendency to think that if you become successful, you're going to get out of there and magically you're going to end up in some utopia somewhere and everything is going to be different. Everything is going to be different. What I discovered was that more things were similar than were not. To give you an example, in this rehearsal room that I was telling you about, it was only about three blocks away from Capitol Records. That would end up being my home for 13 years. Mm -hmm. The recording studio that was Fort Apache, where we recorded the Crimson Idol, 
was less than a mile to the south of us. All those major recording studios are right in that square mile there. A&M Records, where we did one of our sets of early demos before the record came out, all of that stuff was done in there. So what happens is that you get a record deal, get a little bit of success, get a better car to drive, and probably living somewhere better, but you find when you work, you're still coming back to the mile. And that's the mind-blowing part, because, like I said, you think somehow miraculously you're going to end up in this utopia situation where everything is going to be different, but it's not. Like I said, you're driving a better car, if you had a car to begin with. You're driving something better, yeah, you're, you're sleeping in a better place, but you're still coming back to that square mile to work. And this went on for over 20 years. It went on for the seven-year period when I first moved here, and I had nothing, and I mean nothing, and then started having some success in the studios in town. To give you an example, where the studio was was on the corner of Santa Monica and Vine. A few years prior to that, before we got a record deal, when, when Wasp was first together, there was a laundromat that was catty corner to our building. There was a laundromat over there. We would rehearse in there after 9 o'clock at night because we worked out a deal with the owner where he would let us rehearse in there for like 50 bucks a week. Fast forward 10 years, I now own the building catty corner to that, that intersection that we're now making our records in. I can look out of the front door of the studio and still see the laundromat over across the street hmm. where we used to rehearse in at night. You know, and I remember telling somebody, you know, we were standing on the street corner from where this rehearsal room was in Hollywood. We're now around the corner at SIR Rehearsal Studios, which was very expensive. And for somebody, you know, that had never experienced something like that, that was a big deal for us at the time. And I remember telling Chris, we were standing on the corner waiting across the street, and we could look and see where our old rehearsal place was, at, at one end of the street, and then we could see SIR on the other. And I told him, I says, you know what? That's the longest hundred yards I ever walked in my life. <laughs> because, I mean, if you think about it, it's true. But it was all in that square mile. Yeah. And it continued to be for, for years and years after we started having success. So, you, like I said, you think somehow it's going to be different, but more of it was similar than it wasn't. And it's, uh, that's kind of a mind-blowing experience once the reality sets in. Because even though you're, you're, you've had success, you're still driving into those places, and you're driving right by the places you, where you used to live or used to rehearse or whatever, and nothing changes. Yeah. Hey, I got, I got 10 minutes about left here, and I promised a couple callers I'd let them get on with you. One more quick one from me. Uh, recently, we lost Frankie Benali. And he was a part of the Wasp lineup as well. What are your memories about Frankie and what he brought to the band? Oof, where do you start? You know, I mean, you're talking about the first guy I met the very first night I was ever in Hollywood. And just, you know, when I was talking about strange things that, that happened in my life, this would certainly rank as one of them. I mean, what's the chances of that happening, that he was new, I was new, and you end up not just remaining friends, but actually doing work of, of substance together. I mean, Frankie was one of those guys, he was a musician's musician. And I'm not just saying this because he's gone now, I mean, because it's, it's a fact. I learned a lot of stuff from him, and one of the things I learned from Frankie was what him and I used to refer to as the toolbox, where you are so well-rounded enough, not only can you carry on conversations about Tito Puente or Miles Davis or, or things that aren't related necessarily to the genre that you may be in, but you know how to do a lot of that stuff that they do. And so when Frankie and I would be working together, we would literally go outside the box looking for ideas. 
and there was very little that he couldn't do. And if we ever came up with an idea of something that he was struggling with, he'd figure out a way of making it work because he could go to that toolbox and start cobbling enough things together that he could figure out a way to make it work. He was mm-hmm. extraordinary when it comes to that. And as a friend, I miss him. I mean, I just, there's no other way to say it. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I felt when he passed, my Hollywood childhood went with him. Yeah. Um, let me do this, Blackie. I know I told you we would not hold you through a break, but I, I'm, timing-wise, it's going to work out a little bit better. So I'm going to do a quick break here, Joel. Uh, Blackie, if you don't mind sitting through like two, three-minute break, and when we come sure. back, we'll have about 10 minutes left, and I, I I could talk to you all day. It's been too long. We'll do more down the line. I promised a few phone calls, and you were nice enough to say it's cool to have a few callers join us. Sure. So right after this break, a few of you folks, I'll let you on the air to say hi to Blackie Lullis. Again, waspnation.com. The tour is now announced. Check out and see if there's a date coming near you. Uh, near you. Go to the site right now. We'll come right back. A few more minutes of Blackie Lawless after this on Trunk Nation. All right, we got a few more minutes left to go. I could talk to Blackie forever, and we'll hopefully do more down the line, but I promised the audience a chance to say a quick hello, uh, ask a quick question. Time is short, so we'll get as many in as we can here. Uh, let us begin with David, who's in California first up. David, you're on with Blackie Lawless. Hi, Eddie. Hi, Blackie. Thanks for the time. Hi, David. How are you? Hi. Good, good. Um, I'm going to stick in the magical period, as you called it, uh, 83. I have a question regarding uh, Motley Crue's Shout Out the Devil album comes out. It's uh, it's a breakthrough album for the band. They're on tour with Ozzy. They're playing the Us Festival. Little did I know that the look and image of that band was identical to a band called Sister, your band. And my question is, what was your headspace at that time, seeing this and thinking, that could have been me, should have been me, that will be me? What were your thoughts on that? I was at a period in my life where I was more interested in writing songs, and I didn't really think I would probably ever play live again. I know that may sound strange to you right now, but I was concentrating on songwriting. And Nikki and I had been really good friends. I mean, him and I were tight. And so he comes to me one day and he says, Hey, you going to use any of that stuff you used to use? And I said, no, not really. He says, do you mind if I use it? I said, yeah, sure, whatever you want to do. I mean, I I gave him a couple of cautionary tales about, uh, you know, getting into the occult stuff, which went kind of through one ear and out the other. But, uh, you know, it was what he wanted to do. So I really, you know, that was his thing, whatever he wanted to do. But, um, you know, any time... You reach a, a point in your career where you think you're going to go one direction, and you end up going somewhere else. I mean, to, to be totally honest, when we did, I was talking about these early demos. Believe it or not, we never had any intention of playing live. We never thought we were going to play live until we got to the end of doing all those demos. And Chris and I started talking one day and said, well, maybe we ought to take these out and try them in front of people. We think that these, some of these songs are okay. Why don't we give them a shot? That's where then we started going back to what him and I knew before. So that's really that's the genesis of it. Why do you think Sister didn't happen, Blackie? Why do you think that Wasp timing. happened, Sister didn't? Just timing? Timing. Yeah, because the, there was, if you go back and you look at the late 70s in L.A., there was only one band that came out of here at that time, and that was Van Halen. And um, I could tell you a story about how that happened, but it, and it was kind of a fluke the way it happened. There was another band that Ted Templeman went to see that night, and I won't mention who they are, but Van Halen happened to be opening the show. And Van Halen got paid a case of beer that night, but Ted Templeman saw them, and what's the old expression? Lives have been changed by missing a bus or destinies, you know. So uh, things like that. Who, happen, why? Why won't they you say who the only band, band that came out of here? Why won't you say who the band is who he went to see? Uh, I don't want to embarrass them because <laughs> Ted Templeman went to see them. 
Did they, did they ever become anything? Yes, they did. It's probably in a book somewhere. I probably know, but I'm probably spacing. But all right. Here's here's Joe in Nevada. Joe, go ahead. You're on with Blackie Lawless. Hi, uh, Blackie. Uh, my name's Joe. Hi, Joe. Um, how are you doing? Glad Good to hear thing. you're coming back in concert. Ain't we all? Show. Yes. I've been trying to log on while I'm listening to you also to get the tickets for Anaheim. And it's not letting me through yet, but I'm going to keep trying. I just want one quick Well, I question. think they just went up about an hour ago, so it might take you a little bit. Yeah, the tour actually got announced with this show, uh, with the announcement of it at three o'clock Eastern. So it's probably just it's probably just getting ramped up. Joe, keep trying. What's your question for Black? I will. I just wanted to ask him um, since you're doing some uh, new album coming up, are you going to include any of your older songs, like from Sister or even from Killer Kane? Even one, I would love to hear it. Even the old version, or if you could re-record one of them. That would be the most awesome thing to hear. I wouldn't think so, because I think any of that stuff that you're referring to, you could find it on YouTube. I mean, somebody's documented it somewhere at some time. Um, And I also think, you know, just from my own personal uh, position, I would want to do something newer. You know, because, again, you know, what I was talking about earlier in the show is that the best way to make music is to reflect who you are at the moment, not who you were five years ago or where you think you might be in five years from now because the you can't write from an honest perspective, especially the lyrics. You know, So anything I'm going to do, I'm tr- going to try to give you a, a little snapshot of what's going on in my head at the moment. Got a couple minutes here left. Here's Al in Jersey. Go ahead, Al, jump in. Blackie, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Another Jersey boy. How are you? <laughs> I'm good. Uh, just real quick, I want to put in a request for Hollowed Ground. Maybe you got you could play that song on the the tour, being a fellow New Jerseyan and uh, 9/11, you know, hitting close to home. It yeah, has been track, discussed. So. It has definitely been okay, discussed. Cool. cool. Uh, my question, I'll be real quick. Uh, you know, going back to your stage show and how extreme, you know, you you guys, you know, put on a show. Um, I can't help but think but uh, that a lot of bands in the black metal genre really took a lot of cues from your uh, your ideas. Has anybody, has any bands or artists in that genre ever come up to you and, and you know, uh, thanked you or just, you know, gave you props for that? Well, you know, and I'm going to be totally honest with you. To answer your question, yes. But what I never really understood, and this is maybe my childlike naivete, I never could understand the connection between the two, but apparently there was a number of them that saw it. I've never asked anyone specifically what it was we were doing that pointed them in that direction, because I know what our direction was when we first started. We had a theory of we were going to look more like a punk band meets Road Warrior but we were going to play more mainstream music. I mean, that was the whole basis of our foundation or the philosophy of where we started. So to see it morphed into another direction, yeah, I've heard it a lot of times, but I, if you had to ask me why, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> All right, well, listen, i got to wrap this up here, but uh, Wasp, 40 years live, world tour, uh, folks, all you guys asking me and asking Blackie and asking anyone, where is Wasp? When are they going to play America? First time in 10 years, you got a tour starting October 29th in Anaheim and running through mid-December. Uh, you just heard early on in the show, Blackie talked about the development of the stage show. They're working on that now. Set list working on that now. And uh, a lot of great stuff. Armored Saints, special guest on all the dates. If you're in Texas or Oklahoma, you're also getting Michael Schenker. My friend, it's so great to connect with you and hear from you again. I'm so happy you're doing this. And it's wonderful you know, talking as always. This. This, is an hour and a, this was an hour and a half. It went by like five minutes, you know? It did. It always does when we get talking. So anytime you want to come back on, maybe we'll do more when we get closer to the start of the tour. Uh, I get to L.A. quite a bit. Hopefully, maybe we can even do something in person. But um, all the to. best to you. All the best to you for the new year. Right, and and uh, care, bud. on behalf of all the rock fans, welcome back to the U.S. We're psyched to have you. Thanks a million. All right, there he goes, everybody. Blackie Lawless again. WaspNation.com is the website to find the dates, information, 
There's also a Facebook page. There's a Twitter. There's an Instagram. Just search for those official outlets. Keep up everything going on with Wasp and this tour, music, box set, book, all of that. One of my favorites from the very first Wasp album, Love Machine, taking us out here on Trunk Nation. Thanks to Blackie. Thanks to you for listening. I'll be back live tomorrow, 2 o'clock p.m. Eastern time here on Trunk Nation, talking more rock with you. Take care.